So today I get to um, moderate this panel and this panel will focus on, focuses on the successful integration of peer specialists into clinical settings alongside clinicians, therapists, medical staff, and other helping professionals. We have asked folks who work in various clinical settings in our local community to share their experience working alongside peer specialists in a panel discussion style. I have a couple questions that I'm going to be asking them to share their experience, to prompt them to share their experience, and then we might have time at the end for a couple of questions from our audience. Now I would like to ask you all if you would mind introducing yourselves with your name and the organization that you're representing today. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Peggy Page. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from mental health and substance use disorder. I'm also a registered certified peer recovery specialist and I'm employed at the Richmond Behavioral and Health Authority, also known as RBHA. I work in peer support for the Rich Recovery Integrated Healthcare Clinic. The clinic provides accessible, <clears throat> excuse me, affordable and quality medical services for RBHA consumers. In my role of peer support, I focus on getting the individual the help and the support that they need at that particular time, meeting them right where they are. Um, I listen. I may even share some of my lived experience it, it, when, um, whenever it's relevant. Um, I share resources. I assist with the flow of OBOT, which is the office-based opioid treatment. I check in with peers on call or in person. I document my services. I remind them of appointments. I check on them when they miss appointments. I encourage them when they make positive choices. Uh, we reframe if they make mistakes. And I advocate for them when needed, and I affirm and congratulate them on their accomplishments. So that's what I do. Thank you. You want me next? Yes. Hi, I'm Jordan Siebert. I am a certified peer recovery specialist, and I work at the Daily Planet Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, I primarily, well, I started by supporting the people who are in the medication assisted treatment program that we have there because I am someone who used a medication assisted treatment program as part of my journey. And I'm a huge believer that that pathway is a very relevant pathway. And so I love supporting people in that program. However, as I am the only peer there right now, I also support people who come in for anything else that they would like support with, right? We have a really great behavioral health team and psychiatry team, and I get referrals from them. I also support people at our medical respite facility where I run a peer group and support people individually. And yeah, so I, I, I'm on the phone a lot and I'm in person a lot and do groups, all of the above. But I love working with the team that I work with and I love supporting the people I support because they, we are the same, right? We are work, walking in that same space. I was a patient at the Daily Planet before I was honored enough to get a job there. So um, I'm, I'm kind of partial, so I love it there. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Panelists, really quick, if you wouldn't mind speaking into the mic a little bit oh, more. Oh, I'm not so doing it. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's all is good. Is there anything I should repeat? I think Oh, sure. that is different. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. Go ahead, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jennifer Sears Cockrum. I go by Jenny, and I am a clinical supervisor at Chesterfield County Mental Health Support Services. Um, I oversee a multidisciplinary team of substance use specialists that includes peer specialists, case managers, therapists, counselors, social workers. Um, we also have nurses and a prescriber for our OBOT program. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. All right, so my first question is for our peers. What do you enjoy about working in a clinical environment and how have you seen your work impact the people that you serve? Um, I can go. Uh, what I enjoy about working in a clinical environment that I'm in is the professionalism, 
and the teamwork. Um, we have an awesome team that is uh, positioned to treat the whole person. I see my work impact the individuals that I serve when they began to focus on the hope. The hope, um, the hope shifts their attention to the wellness and their strengths and their abilities. So I also see the motivation when they share um, their accomplishments with um, employment and housing or addressing their overall health care issues, um, asking for help and support of their choice. And I see hope and growth and I see them thrive. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Okay, it's my turn. Can, can you hear me? Just, just checking. <laughs> Thanks. I enjoy working in a clinical environment because I like working in a well-rounded team to support a person's goal for change or to support their desire to learn more about possible changes that they can make. Often when people come to me, they're not completely sure that they want these changes. I'm sure that I'm not alone in this experience in this room. Working with clinicians and psychiatric and medical <coughs> providers means that we can support that whole person. When someone gets referred to me, often they will communicate that they are relieved to have someone who knows what I am going through. And while everyone who does this work is extremely aware that people go into the helping professions for all different reasons, a lot of people have lived experience on clinical teams, not just the certified peers, but because this is my role to use my experience, they get to connect with someone on that level peer to peer. The connection that is formed between peers can be powerful. Now, I get that I'm stating the obvious here um, in a room full of peers and providers. <laughs> this is an addition to a whole team supporting a person is incredible. I have seen my impact when working with people in our agency, sometimes for years, and sometimes I've worked with someone for one day and seen an impact. For someone who is feeling alone, scared, and a lot of times unable or unwilling to communicate that fear and hopeless, talking to someone else who has been in their shoes, who may know some of the struggle that they're coping with right now and seeing that people can make changes, that is powerful. I am someone who likes to see action rather than have someone tell me something. People can say all day long, you helped me, but I have seen people make changes after I've supported them. Seeing someone go to their first 12-step meeting or their first 12-step meeting in a long time and connecting with others, seeing someone advocate for their needs at their job after we worked out how they can best do this so they can put their mental health treatment or their SUD recovery first in their life, that's powerful. Having someone reach out to me out of nowhere to talk about the craving that they just had when they have not trusted people in the past enough to do this, and then successfully abstained from using, or having someone consider putting down alcohol after working with them for a year and a half through ambivalence, that's the power of having a peer on the team. Thank you. Jenny. <laughs> How has having peers involved in your services benefited your clients? Oh my goodness, this is my favorite question. Um, I, I call it peer magic. Um, and what I like to tell people on my team and in other clinical environments is that the peer fills a gap in a clinical setting. They fill that gap between the educated professional who sits behind the desk and the client who comes in looking for help. They sit right in between those two people. Um, what it really comes down to is better trauma-informed care. The peer joins with the client. They relate directly to what the client has gone through. They offer a sense of safety um, they might even neutralize some of those environmental stressors that might just be a part of the, the setting. For example, my agency, I work for community mental health. It's government. It's county. Um, my building literally sits right behind the county courthouse, right across the street from CPS. 
right next to the police station. Um, you see where I'm going with this? Like, and, and our primary population that we work with are substance use clients. Who, oh, did I mention the jails right down the street too? Like, I mean, these are clients who have been in and out of the system. They may have lost their children to the system. They've been in and out of jail. They're not getting any warm and fuzzies when they walk into our building. But when the peer is there, that peer is able to hopefully from day one, meet them in the lobby, introduce themselves, share their lived experience as a person who has also gone through the system, understands what that feels like, has come out the other side thriving and has now been employed by that system to help the client move through it. And that it's invaluable, um, absolutely invaluable. Um, one other thing that I've noticed is in a little more indirect way is that when you put a peer in a meeting that's full of clinical providers, doctors, nurses, um, social workers, and you have them tell their story and share why they do what they do, something happens. Um, it kind of sends ripples across the whole, all the disciplines. And those ripples might look like more awareness of the use of stigmatizing language in meetings, uh, more awareness of negative talk and judgmental talk in meetings, um, more compassion and empathy, a broader perspective of what a recovery journey is, uh, a deeper understanding of what that takes, what it takes to move through recovery. Um, and that leads over, it, it moves through the, through the different disciplines, through your doctors and nurses, and it affects how they treat and interact with their clients. It's really pretty cool. Um, and one more thought, resources. Omri taught me this. Like, it's one thing to know what your community sports are. It's another thing to have a person on your team, that peer, who says, I am going to that meeting. I know people that go to that meeting. I used that treatment program as a part of my recovery pathway. Um, I know the people there. I actually went to RBHA and graduated, and that made a difference in my life. So again, the peers are special in that way and really invaluable. Thank you. Okay, peers, what challenges have you experienced as a peer working in a clinical setting? Um, well, some of the challenges that I can you see? <clears throat> yep, there you go. Some of the challenges that I have experienced working in a clinical setting is the resistance of some peers who may be seen who may be seen as uncooperative. So with that, I meet them where they are. I share resources and, and opportunities to those individuals as well. Sometimes they may take it or they may not. I look at it as a seed being planted because recovery is possible for everyone. Um, other challenge in clinical setting for me has been the lack of knowledge of what peer services consist of. Someone may ask me, what exactly do you do? And I usually answer with, I help individuals navigate through some of their challenges, even though peer services is a whole lot more. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's short and sweet. I like that one. It's smart. Um, there are many challenges when working as a peer on a team of clinical staff and medical providers. I came to this job right after my training to become a peer. Also, I had just been a patient at the agency, still had a psychiatric provider there. We were still transitioning, right? So it was um, a big transition. Uh, I was wholly aware that peer drift is a real issue and that I am prone to just putting my head down and doing what I'm told at a job, right? So um, instead of standing up and advocating for my role, I had to learn how to advocate for my role when suggestions were made for me to step outside of that role. I am not a registrar, 
nor am I a case manager, although those, a lot of that, there is some crossover with peer work and case management. Those are two positions that are extremely necessary for the work that we do at our agency, but those are not my job. It still feels odd for me to say, not my job, like I'm trying to shirk my responsibilities. <laughs> But that is not the case. If I, started to, if I start to call to make appointments for other providers, which I am perfectly capable of doing, then where does that stop? I did a presentation for my team in the first six months um, when I came to work there, uh, since I was the first peer on the team, first working as a peer. Um, I'm certainly not the only person on my team who has lived experience. And I used, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, it's a PowerPoint, a story of mice and elephants from Becky Sterling at DBHDS. Uh, that is available online and it is fantastic. I think that is still my favorite analogy for, I am in, but not of the system. So when I write my notes, I am very mindful of using lay terms since clinical terms abound on my team and it is very easy to fall into that use of language. I ensure that I am encouraging people to seek the treatment that is right for them, whether our, at our agency or not, although I know that my colleagues do this as well. And I have found a voice when advocating for seeing situations from a different perspective. But I had to learn how to do this as it does not come naturally at all to me. Thank you. Jenny, um, how, what challenges have you experienced incorporating peers into your team's services? Um, I'm going to steal Jordan's word, advocating. Um, advocating is difficult on a clinical team. Uh, I completely agree. A lot of people don't understand what peers do. And I think in part that's because there's a whole wide range of what peers do out there. Um, and not a whole lot of them are in clinical settings and truly doing the peer work. Um, so a challenge to me was actually giving, giving them a voice, uh, making time for them to have a voice in the meetings. A, a voice that people would hear and respect. It's challenging, but it's doable. Um, educating myself was part of that. I really thought that I knew what peers did. My sister is a peer. I'm very proud of her. Um, but I learned so much. And this is a challenge, too, was making myself step back and letting the peers lead. Um, I went to trainings with them. I sat down with them and said, you all tell me what you do. Um, I'll tell you what, what we have to do. I know what the agency code of ethics is for, for everyone. We'll start there. But from there, I want you to lead. I want you all to have a discussion. I want you to tell me how you will work best with our people. Um, it was challenging, but we, we defined that role. And we went through boundaries. Every little boundary situation you could think of, social media, friends before they, clients came into treatment, like all of the little things and the feedback was amazing from the clinical providers and from the peers. I think they felt a lot more confident after those discussions and what their role was and a lot more impactful too. Thank you. Okay, uh, peers, what bias and stigmas have you had to confront or change through your role in a clinical setting? I can go. Um, first of all, I want to say, she, you were saying um, graduation from RBHA, but my treatment started at RBHA in 2017. So I am a product of, the R of RBHA. But some of the bias and stigma that I have had to confront or change in my role as a clinical peer is that everyone in the clinic is not on my team. So educating individuals on the certified peer recovery specialist as a profession, which involves prolonged continuous education, trainings, and qualifications. So I have to educate some individuals that we are professionals as well. 
Other confrontations has been with some of the language used referring to the pairs we serve, which is not person-centered. Um, some words used are labeled and or disrespectful. Of course, clinical language is used in the clinic and everyone does not use recovery language. Some people don't even know what recovery language is. But stigmatizing words can cause individuals to um, feel less than human and can contribute to isolation and the resistance to get their needs met. So those are some of the uh, bias and stigma that I've um, confronted. I think one of the biggest biases, honestly, has been my own. I have, at times, had to remind myself that just because I do not have those other initials after my name does not mean that I am somehow less than. I work with some of the most amazing providers who are trained in some of the most amazing clinical and medical interventions, and that can certainly be intimidating. Put that together with the fact that, again, I was once treated by some of the people who I now work next to, you have a recipe for some cognitive distortions. <laughs> I have certainly had to cope with some providers thinking that I speak for all people with the disease of addiction or mental health diagnoses, because that is certainly not the case. <laughs> that has not happened often at all. I work with a team who is extremely trauma-informed, patient, and understanding. That particular issue was with a <laughs> member of medical staff but when I communicated that I was uncomfortable being that spokesperson, I was heard. I am lucky. I have not had anyone question my ability to support others or to be a part of our team. My recovery or history has never come into question. I do know peers who have struggled with that stigma, and I'm very, very lucky to not have that issue within our team. Thank you. Um, Jenny, what bias and stigma have you had to confront or change through your work with peers? Honestly, I think that bias and stigma exists in, in every clinical setting, um, whether people want to admit it or not. Um, but in a county government setting, um, county government, I'm, I'm a little, you know, have my own biases, but we, we're really good at lagging behind. Um, we're, we're really good at not breaking the mold. Um, we're kind of good at that. And so stigmas run rampant. Um, and we kind of, you know, sometimes we create them ourselves. Um, I, to be perfectly vulnerable, I'm a licensed professional counselor by trade. I have a master's degree. I work with a team of people that are highly educated um, and Jordan is not you um, they treat people differently um, we are educated to believe that our education makes us smart um, and our schooling makes us better and so introducing a peer into a setting where their lived experience is the qualification, there, there are biases there, um, even if people say there aren't, even if they say they fully appreciate it. So yes, um, just, just from an appearance level, right? I mean, everybody that I work with has a dress code. Um, we hired a peer who has walked through the door with tattoos ear gauges in street clothes, um, talking very, very plainly in Raleigh about their drug use, their time in jail, their experience with their personal overdose. Um, and you see, you notice, if you're aware, like the, the side eyes and the, you know, whispers, and it, it happens. So, being aware is the first step, right? And then pushing people to speak to that and to challenge their assumptions and what they know and what they've been taught is something that needs to happen. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, 
actually we're doing okay on time. Um, Piers, um, would you mind giving an example of what clinical staff has done at your organization that made you feel supported and valued as a colleague? Well, for me, um, the clinical staff in my organization makes me feel valued and supported as a colleague um, by having me sit at all of the same meetings as the leaders, from grants and research to staff and team meetings. They respect me in my position. They validate my opinions. They ask for my input and ideas and are overall a fantastic group of individuals that I work with. Okay. You don't have a lot of time. I am supported every single day. I have the same voice on the team as anyone else. They're extremely validating. When I need to process, there's that word validation. I mean, it's there. Um, when I need to process a difficult interaction, they're there for me. What is even more validating is that when someone else has a difficult interaction that they need to talk about, they come to me. I feel as valued as the next person. They acknowledge my role is different, but that difference is how I am valuable. <clears throat> Leadership at our agency has allowed me to create programs or to give things a try. The attitude has always been, try it, and if it doesn't work, and try something else. Yep. I have been able to institute a peer group at our medical respite facility where I can support people who are struggling with medical issues on top of their homelessness and often substance use and mental health diagnoses. I've also been able to try writing a newsletter so that other clients in the agency can be informed even if I'm not supporting them directly. I was recently in an accident, and since I rely on public transportation, they created a sign-up sheet for people to give me a ride to work and home again when I'm coming to, into the office. The other days, I get to work from home. What? Again, I am extremely lucky. They would have and have done things like this for anyone on the team. We support one another. Yep. Thank you. And this last question is for all of you. What advice would you give to a program that was about to add or expand peer services within their practice? Jenny? Sure. Uh, well, from a clinical standpoint, I would reiterate some of the things that I already said, honestly. Like, um, join with your peers hire peers, they will fit into any clinical setting. Um, and you really can't go wrong with it. But you need to join with them and you need to let them take the lead. Um, tell them the basis of the code of ethics. Tell them the things that cannot be negotiated. For example, one of ours was mandated reporting. Our peers are and must be mandated reporters. Um, but past that, how can you grow it? Um, and let them just follow their lead. Oh, I have other stuff here. Um, keep an open mind. Be willing to think outside of the box. Be prepared to push back against certain things. Um, I found myself a couple of months ago redesigning a job ad for our peer that we want to hire into our MAT program. And I found myself sitting across from our HR manager and saying to her, I need to add some specific things to this job advertisement. I said, I. I need to hire someone who has 10 years or more of incarceration. And I need to hire someone who has five to 10 years at least of uh, clinic experience receiving MAT treatment. Um, and I mean, this is county government, right? So she looks at me and she's like, you know we run background checks, right? And you know there's barrier crimes. And I said, mm -hmm. I know, and I can't fill this position without those qualifications. So, so how can you help me do that? Um, be ready to push back. And you might be surprised at how, how far you get. Um, Let me see here. A couple other things. Work with your peers. Come up with a code of ethics for your peers. Um, write that up. But specifically for your peers, it's really helpful. And if you have overlapping some overlapping responsibilities on the team, like a case manager, a clinician, a peer specialist that are sharing roles, make a role matrix, okay? Make a column, chart it out. Column for each, for each um, title, case manager, clinician, 
here and then go through each of their job responsibilities and talk about how they're different and how they're the same. Share that with your peers, share that with your clinical team. It does help, it makes a really big difference. Um, but mostly just hire, hire them, bring them on, do it. You, you definitely will not regret it. Oh, oh, one more thing too. Um, excited about this. Um, you wanna hire peers, I would also suggest that you hire peers that have equivalent experience, lived experience to the clients that they're gonna be serving. Um, it might sound like a given, but you wanna be really careful with that. Um, the magic of it, the peer magic really lies in that parallel between the lived experience of your peer and the lived experience of the clients that they're serving. So as much as they can relate to each other there, you're gonna see that um, output on the other side, so. Okay. Uh, my advice would, that I would give a, to a program would be for uh, a certified peer recovery specialist to have a considerable amount of abstinence um, they should be active in their own and engaged in their own recovery community with support, um, experience in peer services, meaning um, continued education on a regular basis. Uh, the program should listen to their needs for assistance from, for, from your program to help you and their peers be open-minded, give room and respect uh, to grow within your program. Give them room and respect to grow within the program. That's about it. One of my first recommendations is to not put parameters, parameters on the hire, such as must, must have bachelor's degree, right? Like that is certainly preferred and I get it. I totally understand that. But as someone who does not have a bachelor's degree, it is absolutely possible for a certified peer without a bachelor's degree to integrate onto a clinical team, right? Like, so that is possible. All of that other stuff, right? Like notes, writing notes, and professionalism, and how to compose oneself, that is, can all be taught and learned by people who are in recovery because we're super resilient people, come on, right? Um, so, <laughs> Let's see, my next piece of advice is to treat that person like any other member of the team while keeping in mind that they are not of the system, right? Like that's a, a big thing. Uh, to me, that means that while I work on a clinical team, I am not a clinician. Um, be prepared to have someone new and different on the team and embrace those differences. Be open to suggestions from that person. I really love the suggestion that the person who is like I am, am still an MAT like that is a part of my recovery plan right I've been in recovery now for seven years seven and a half years like it is still something that I do right like that supports my continued stability and recovery just like I take psychiatric medications for my depression and my anxiety right it is a tool that is used um, and so it is really helpful that I have that experience when supporting people in an MAT program, right? Um, someone this morning in group said, you, you don't know how hard it is. And I said, really? Really, dude? Seriously? And I got to break that down. Um, I also really love working at the Daily Planet because we support the homeless population, right? And while homeless has a very broad definition, right? We use Hearst's definition, which is people who are doubling up or living in hotels or in a rooming house or in a recovery house or in transitional, house. like all, it's very broad, right? Um, I have that experience as I have been homeless on and off for most of my adult life. So um, that is something that is extremely helpful to be able to relate to the people who I am supporting. I've been homeless in recovery or yeah, never thought that was possible but i am now able to use those things that i've gone through right and support the people who come in to see me so yeah those are my suggestions thank you all so much and i just um wanted to take just a, a couple seconds to just add um i had to get emotional um 
Jenny Cockrum is um, somebody that I actually used to work with um, at the Chesterfield CSB as a certified peer recovery specialist on her team. Everything that she has said today is stuff that she's taken action on. And I would not be the, the peer specialist that I am if it wasn't for her, her amazing leadership and um, empowering me and letting me lead and create this amazing peer recovery support program at the CSB. And so I really hope that this, that seeing this today and hearing all of their experience can be an example of peers being used in the correct way within the clinical system and that it can work. And like, I, I you know, I, um, uh, I, some of the things that I was able to do while I was there was like starting a medically assisted recovery support group for our folks who are um, engaged in our MAT program and, you know, being a part of an aftercare support group, being a part of um, a care and concern group that was for parents of children um, who, uh, who were uh, struggling with active addiction, like, and she was like, it never was like, no, you can't do that, or no, that's not something that's within your wheelhouse or anything. It was, no, go do it because it's a need. And so I just, I just, I wanted to say thank you. Yep. Y'all, it's all her. Like, I mean, seriously, this this was Omri that brought the brought the strengths to the team. I'm just, they just tell me what to do, <laughs> and I help with it. I'm just the assister. So you're but a good listener. You. That's what I'm hearing. Well, I am a therapist, so. 